Today we are talking with James Card, the author of Target Tokyo, Jimmy Dolittle and the Raid that Avenged Pearl Harbor. Welcome to Radara. Thanks for having me on today. Thank you. It's a wonderful and well-researched book, and the book has been selected as、uh, one of the finalists for the Pulitzer Prize as well. So congratulations for that as well. Thank you. Thank you. It's very exciting indeed. Can you give us a little bit of、uh, overview of,、uh, or the set the little bit of stage or context?、Uh, what was happening at that time in the Second World War, and how did we arrive to the Pearl Harbor situation? Absolutely. So yeah, the book is, a, a, as you know, is Jimmy Doolittle and the raid that avenged Pearl Harbor, and it really the story really starts with the day that the United States enters World War II, and that is, of course, the attack on Pearl Harbor. Japanese attack there. Literally destroyed much of the、uh, America's Pacific Fleet, its naval power.、Uh, but the Japanese didn't just stop with the attack on Pearl Harbor. They went on、uh, over the matter of the next few months to capture Hong Kong and Singapore from the British. Wake and Guam、uh, would soon fall both American possessions.、Uh, the Philippines was under siege and would fall、uh, that spring as well. And、uh, the Japanese even made uh, took um, what we now know today as Indonesia and made raids against Australia. All of this happened just in a few short months after the attack on Pearl Harbor. So much so that literally within about six months,、uh, the Japanese Empire had grown to an area of about 20 million square miles,、uh, covering about seven time zones.、Uh, another way of looking at it was about one tenth of the world was under Japanese control. So this was a really dark, bleak period in American history.、Uh, the spring of 1942,、uh, as well as you know, world history for American allies, and the United States was looking for a way. Sort of some sort of measure to assure the American public in this dark time that even though、uh, America was down, we were not out, and that eventually we would win, we would prevail, and、uh, and win the war.、Uh, and 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 that that's really where the Doolittle raid comes into play. Is that sort of a way? Not only is it a military raid, but it's also a a, a desperate、um, effort by the United States, by President Franklin Roosevelt, to sort of demonstrate to the American public that we could still we could still fight. Because you have to remember, the United States from the day of the war. Began, we weren't in a position to go on the offensive. I mean, we didn't. It would take much of 1942 for us to build、uh, the warships and the planes, to enlist and train the troops, to manufacture the guns and the bullets. But he,、uh, President Roosevelt really knew that the American public wasn't wouldn't wait that long for us to be able to go on the offensive. So he had to have some sort of public morale booster, if you will, some sort of military operation. And with that, the Doolittle Raid was born. <laughs> I think in the early part of the、uh, early phase of the war, the America was, or the, at least the policy at that time, was focused on avoiding civilian casualties.、Mm-hmm. And、uh, explain to us that how Doolittle Raid、uh, was conceived, how it was planned, because there were some logistical and technical challenges. Certainly, yeah. I mean, the Doolittle Raid really—it was a.、Uh, I mean, you have to understand for, for the United States to be able to.、Uh, To attack Japan at this point was an incredibly difficult proposition because, as I noted a moment ago, we'd lost any hope of any bases in those areas. The fall of Guam, the、uh, Philippines being under siege, so there really wasn't, you know, we didn't have any、uh, any area for which to launch any kind of operation. And so, at the same time, we realized that it was also too difficult or too risky to take American aircraft carriers all the way into Japanese waters because you have to remember. The, the one bright spot about the attack on Pearl Harbor was that our, our aircraft carriers, the three that we had in the Pacific Fleet, weren't there that day, so they were saved from destruction. But、uh, but to take those carriers in and be able to use carrier-based planes to attack Japan would mean we'd literally have to steam them almost to the, you know, within just a couple hundred miles, and that was simply too risky. We needed those aircraft carriers、uh, for defense of the, of the of the homeland, and so we really were kind of up against the wall. You know, it's too dangerous to send a few aircraft carriers. We don't have any bases in the region from which to operate from. So how are we going to come up with this way to strike back? And for Roosevelt, as commander in chief and as president, he wasn't really—he didn't really care as much about logistics as much as he did about the need to assure the American public. So he kept pressuring his senior military leaders to find a way to strike back, and not just an attack against the far-flung islands in the Japanese Empire, but an attack directly against Tokyo. And so his senior military leaders were really sort of banging their heads trying to figure out, you know, how can we pull this off? We don't have any bases. It's too risky to take our aircraft here. What can we do? And、the idea really came in early 1942 in January when a Navy officer on the staff of、um, Admiral Ernest King, who was essentially the head of the Navy at that time, was out in Norfolk, Virginia, and he was looking at he was watching pilots,、uh, Navy pilots, practicing carrier takeoffs on an airfield that was designed to look like an aircraft carrier.、Uh, so it was marked up sort of with the boundaries of what an aircraft carrier would look like. And he just had a thought. 
said, what if instead of using Navy planes, which, you know, only have one engine and can fly shorter distances, what if we swap those out and used bigger Army bombers that had two engines that could fly greater distances and that would be able to take off farther out at sea? What if we tried to fly those off of an aircraft carrier? And that was just something that had never before been thought of and or even tested. But yet that was the genesis of the dual raid. And so at that point began a major logistics challenge, figuring out whether or not it was possible. And if so, you know, how, to, how to go about doing it. And, uh, you know, all of that fell on the shoulders of 45-year-old Lieutenant Commander Jimmy Doolittle, uh, who's truly one of the most fascinating characters of the, uh, of the 20th century, without a doubt. Well, tell us a little bit more about Jimmy DeLille. What was he like? Uh, how, uh, how he got involved and recruited for this, and how did he organize this? Right? I believe there were 80 people in the team. There were. And Doolittle was really, he's a, uh, like I said, he's one of the fascinating characters of the 20th century. And he was, to give you a little bit of background on him, he was born in California, but at a young age, his father had relocated the family to Alaska, where his dad was an unsuccessful gold prospector. And this was a really rugged time in Alaskan history. At the turn of the century, you know, it was, uh, he lived in Nome, which was just this frontier town. And he, he used to like to say it had more saloons than it did schools for children. And he learned if he was going to, he was, he was pretty small. Doolittle was also pretty small in stature. He was about five feet, four inches tall. Uh, so small, in fact, that on all of his military records, he upped his height by two inches. So for a, a young, small boy growing up in this sort of wild environment, he realized if he was going to survive, he'd need to learn how to fight. So uh, he, he ended up learning how to fight, and he became so good at it that later in life, he ended up being a professional boxer, of all things. Wow. How did he join the Army, and how did he move up to the level that the Army trusted him to carry out such an important raid? So, yeah, so Doolittle, um, as I said, he'd come back to the United States to go to college, and he'd always harbored an interest in flying. And so he enlisted in the Army, uh, which at that time was training pilots. And Doolittle uh, turned out to be a really great pilot. And so good, in fact, that rather than send him overseas to fight in World War I, the Army kept him home to train new pilots. And he later actually complained. He said, uh, you know, I was uh, all these all my trainees were going overseas and becoming heroes, and my job was to stay home and make more heroes. Well, when World War I ended, um, Doolittle uh, faced a challenge. Does he get out of the Army and get a job, or does he stay in the Army? And he realized that the Army was the one place where he could fly every day and still get paid. And so he chose to stay. And, uh, and this was also the early era of aviation, if you will. And pilots were constantly testing themselves, testing their um, airplanes and whatnot, seeing what these new uh, incredible new uh, machines could do. And so Doolittle jumped into the fray. You know, he's a fighter, fighter's mentality. And so he set a number of speed records and distance records. He's the first pilot to ever fly cross country uh, using um, uh, in a day, less than a day. It took him 22 hours. Uh, he also realized at this time that it was um, one of the biggest obstacles facing pilots was the inability to fly if you couldn't see where you were going. And so he helped develop the artificial horizon. And he's the first pilot to ever fly, uh, take off, fly over set course and land again using only instrumentation. Uh, and I'll add, too, that Jimmy Doolittle earned his master's and his doctorate at MIT. So he's an incredibly smart guy as well as a brave and adventurous. So he's really, because of the unique nature of this raid that's going to take, you know, cunning, it's going to take also a sharp mind to figure out these, these logistics, it really was the perfect raid for someone like Jimmy Doolittle because he had all of that. Uh, all of those key elements that were needed to pull all this off. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So now that we have the right men to lead the raid, uh, what happened? How, if you just keep going and explain how the raid was organized, what were the key challenges that he had to come overcome in training others or organizing or martial resources? Certainly. Well, the key thing is, you know, they very quickly had to figure out what kind of plane. If they were going to use a new plane, an Army plane on aircraft carrier, they had to figure out which one would work. And they very quickly settled on the B-25. And the only reason they picked the B-25 was because, you have to remember, these are Army airplanes. They're bigger twin engines. They're bigger than Navy planes. But the B-25 was still small enough that if, if it was put on an aircraft carrier and it had to go down the flight deck and take off, it had about six feet of clearance from the tip of the wing to the aircraft carrier's um, island or superstructure. So it could just barely sort of slide by and take off. Uh, but they also realized that it, because it was so large and everything, and because of its the, the, the way it was built, that while it might be able to take off, it would never be able to land again. And that meant that this was going to have to be a one-way mission. These planes were going to have to take off, bomb Tokyo and, and other cities in Japan, and then fly on to free China. And they'd have to be able to do all of that without ever landing anywhere and refueling. So they had to look at fuel. And they realized that it was going to be about 2,400 miles would be about what they'd need to be able to fly. 
the problem was the B-25 only had a range of about 1,300 miles. So they would almost have to double how far these planes could fly. So they had to come up with these rubber fuel tanks, these bladders that could be inserted in the plane. They came up with three of them that could be sort of shoehorned in, in, into empty spaces. But aviation fuel is really heavy. One gallon of gasoline weighs about six pounds. So if you're going to add all this fuel, you've got to strip everything out of the plane that you don't need it. And that included things like radios, a lower gun turret with a machine gun. So they had to really balance out the additional weight with the subtracting of weight. And then on top of that, they had to teach these Army pilots how to take off from a Navy aircraft carrier. And so to do that, they got these volunteer, 80 volunteer airmen took them down to a remote airfield in Florida in the Florida Panhandle, and they brought in a Navy carrier pilot to train them in the art of carrier takeoffs. And, uh, and they did that out there in secrecy. So it's really, you know, an incredible marshalling, not only of engineering skills and everything else, but of, you know, the Navy's technical flying skills and whatnot. So it's really just amazing to think that they were able to pull all of this together in just a matter of you know, a few short months. Who were the other key figures? If you can name or explain two, one or two more, that kind of became part of the whole entourage and they played a leading role. Yeah, I mean, the, the great thing, I mean, the Doolittle Raid really, I mean, you have Jimmy Doolittle, of course, you have his 80 airmen, but it really, you know, the operation really touched on a lot of the senior figures in the American military and political establishment at that time. Of course, Roosevelt was one of the key figures who was driving it. You had uh, Admiral Ernest King, who was head of the Navy, who was pushing it. You had General Hap Arnold, who was head of the uh, Army Air Forces. And then, you know, to lead the Navy's role in all this, you had Admiral Bull Halsey, who's one of the most colorful admirals the Navy had. You know, and he, his job is to essentially be the uh, task force commander to take Doolittle and his men all the way across the uh, Pacific. So it's really it, it is sort of a who's who, if you will. Of, uh, of senior and, and well-known American figures that uh, played a, an important role on this mission. Mm -hmm. Of course, after the Pearl Harbor attack, there was a lot of pressure on President Roosevelt. And uh, what was his strategy regarding Pearl Harbor and also on the coastal provinces of China? Yeah, now, you know, I mean, the, the key thing here, you know, I mean, really the, the dual rate, as I noted earlier, it was, it was a way to send a message to the American public that while we were down, we were not out. But it also had an important message that he was trying to send to the Japanese, which was, you know, that the Japanese public had long been told by the uh, Japanese government that, you know, hey, we're invincible. You know, we've, we've beat the Americans at Pearl Harbor. We beat the British in Singapore and Hong Kong. And you know, we've, we've had all these great victories. That, that, that we were really trying to sow dissent, if you will, between the Japanese public and the Japanese uh, government and military leadership by bombing their main cities. And that was the importance of picking Tokyo instead of picking somewhere some far-flung island is that you really you needed to, you needed the bombing attack that would be witnessed by the civilians that, 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 that would affect the public you know many, many of these people wouldn't be affected by something that happened in New Guinea or elsewhere so you really had to take the fight to the Japanese shores now along those lines Doolittle was really adamant that you know it was important that his pilots you know that they not kill civilians that they not bomb the emperor's palace and these types of things because you know again those types of deaths would result in the Japanese public rallying around their leaders. You know, if they'd gone after, for instance, some of the pilots had wanted to bomb Emperor Hirohito's palace and Doolittle would really put his foot down. And that would only lead to more Japanese national unity. And the purpose of the mission was really to sow dissent. So they were really adamant about that. The USS Hornet played a key role in the launch of these uh, uh, B-25 uh, from there. Were there any other logistic uh, complexities or challenges that they had to face in other than moving the uh, aircraft uh, over there, but uh, also uh, because the distance and, and as you mentioned that you, the, these bombers couldn't return back just simply because they were just not long range planes at all. Did the people in coastal provinces in China, were they very helpful to the crews? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's important to stress, I mean, just how incredibly risky this operation really was. I mean, the time of the, uh, the time of the Doolittle raid, we only had five aircraft carriers in our Pacific fleet. Five. That's it. In order to make this operation work, we would have to send two of our five aircraft carriers all the way across the Pacific in radio silence and hope that along the way, that 5,000 mile journey, they didn't run into any patrol boats, any submarines, any merchant ships uh, that might spoil the surprise and might lead to them being ambushed when they reached Japanese waters. 
So, and the, you know, it, so that's a really big risk that the Navy was taking for what really amounted to, in a lot of ways, sort of more of a morale boosting exercise for the American public. Give you an example, you know, five aircraft carriers may seem like a lot, you know, and so we're sending two of them over there, but you have to remember the Japanese had 10 at that point. So we were, you know, aircraft carrier to aircraft carrier, you know, we had half of what they did, and yet we were still willing to take this huge, significant risk. That's part of the logistics. The other part, of course, is that these planes, once they take off, they have to cover this incredible amount of distance, hope that they don't get injured flying over the Japanese homeland. You know, and then from there, they have to make it all the way down to China. And so Doolittle had really had it mapped out that, that, that really every mile every, that they, they flew, every, every drop of gasoline mattered because the distances were so great. Now, when they got to China, they were literally going to be landing on these primitive gravel runways. From there, the idea was that they would refuel and that they would then be able to fly further inland to Chongqing, which was China's wartime capital, which would get them out of the way of the Japanese. So, Jeff, remember, at this point, the Japanese actually control a lot of the key coastal ports and cities along, along China. So getting out of Japan wasn't the only risk. Even getting into China was incredibly dangerous because of the Japanese occupation there. So really, I mean, this, this mission from all throughout was really just fraught with peril for these airmen. And uh, it's, it's really just a, an incredibly dangerous operation at all levels. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And of course, after the, the U.S. attack, there were a lot of casualties in, in Tokyo. And, um, and um, can you give us a little bit how that uh, there were some challenges in unloading or uh, the bombs? That it was a little bit chaotic in, in the process. And some of the hospitals and schools were also uh, not intentionally, but uh, were also uh, affected as well. Yeah, certainly. So, you know, one of the biggest challenges that these pilots faced was, of course, the distance that they had to fly. And the challenge that was is that Doolittle had figured out that if they took off somewhere between 400 and 650 miles from the Japanese coast, they'd have enough fuel to be able to make it to Japan, to bomb their targets, and then escape to free China. Now, the challenge they had was that they were discovered by Japanese more than 800 miles from Japan. So they're way outside of their distance from what they had that they could either take off and, and, and make their mission, or else they were going to run out of fuel over the uh, East China Sea, and those are shark-infested waters in the backyard. So they're really just trying to figure out, you know, do little have a face with this option. Do we go or do we abort this mission? And he made that decision on the morning of April 18, 1942, after they'd been discovered, that they were going to go ahead and take off anyway. It's an incredibly risky move, you know, putting his life and the lives of the 79 airmen at risk. But they'd come this far. They'd invested this much. You know, this was a one shot. And so they took off. They came in. They flew. Uh, they covered that 800 mile distance to Japan and came in. And even though they'd been discovered, the Japanese weren't ready for them because the Japanese thought, well, if American aircraft carriers are coming in, they're bound to be using Navy planes, which have a much shorter distance that they can fly. So the earliest they would attack us is, would be the following day. But because we went ahead and took off right away, our pilots were there over Tokyo and other key industrial cities in a matter of hours. So we did, in fact, catch the Japanese totally off guard. Our 18 planes came in and they bombed, uh, you know, their targets. They bombed steel mills, munitions factories, dockyards, things of that nature. They also did, unfortunately, uh, even though they've been ordered not to hit any civilian targets, they did end up killing some civilians as well, in part just because of the, the density in, in Japan at that time and the, uh, the, uh, the sort of the crowded nature and the inability to distinguish uh, some of the targets that they were aiming for because of just sort of the sea of rooftops. All told, uh, I think about 87 people were killed in the raid, about 150 were seriously injured, and about another 300 suffered more minor injuries. Uh, they destroyed over 100 buildings as well. So even though it was just a small amount of planes, you know, 16 bombers, each carrying just four bombs each, they still were able to do um, some, some serious damage in Tokyo. And again, you know, really the biggest effect on the Japanese was the uh, sort of the shock that, you know, that the Americans, here we are just a few months into the war, and the Americans who the Japanese military and political establishment telling the public for for weeks and weeks and weeks that the Americans would never be able to attack us, and yet here they were just a few months into the war showing up in the skies over Tokyo. So then the, the Raiders then have to push on, you know, low on fuel. They have to try to make it from Japan all the way across the East China Sea to China, uh, to the Asian mainland. And as they're flying – 
you know, the fuel lights pop on and these guys are all convinced that they're going to go down, but they luckily this tailwind comes out of nowhere. It literally blows these guys those last few miles across the, uh, across the sea there so that they, uh, they ultimately make it to the Chinese coast. But at this point, you know, there's a little bit of good luck runs out again. And the, uh, the weather deteriorates. It's getting dark outside. It's raining. The, uh, uh, and these pilots are aiming for these airfields that are sort of tucked between these huge mountains. And these airfields are sort of, you know, gravel runways in these valleys. And they realize that they don't have any, any option but to either crash land on the beaches or to try to bail out. And so uh, one of the planes, which was super low on fuel, diverted to Russia and landed there. But the other 15 all came in and they either crash landed or they uh, the, the airmen uh, bailed out. So all the planes were ultimately lost. Um, three of the airmen were killed at this point during bailout and uh, coming down. The Japanese managed to capture eight others of the raiders. And then the rest then had to sort of escape overland, if you will, into interior China to Chongqing. So it's, it's, it, that in and of itself is, is an incredible adventure story. What was the Japanese leadership and military uh, leadership's response after the attack uh, in Tokyo? Yeah, they, uh, you know, Admiral Yamamoto, who had been the architect of the attack on Pearl Harbor and had been sort of the, the one voice saying, you know, hey, the Americans are coming, the Americans are coming, you know, we're fooling ourselves if we don't. If we don't think that for him, it was the materialization of his worst nightmare. In fact, he went into his stateroom on his uh, on his flagship and just closed the door. <laughs> he just you know had to let his staff take over for for a day or so. The rest of the, the Japanese leadership, many of them were outraged. I mean, they were furious. I mean, this was you know the Americans had come in, they humiliated the uh, Japanese uh, leadership in the eyes of their civilians. You know, they had really uh, and so they were they were really determined to sort of retaliate, if you will. And um, and so, you know, they had captured some of these airmen. They uh, they wanted to put them on trial, which they ultimately did. Russia had interned a few of our airmen, and uh, the Japanese pressured Russia to try to hand them over to Japan because, you know, they'd only captured eight of these airmen, and they wanted to be able to tell the Japanese public that they, you know, we captured so many of them and be able to do this, and they, they simply didn't have enough of them. They went so far as to go to China to get the wreckage of one of these planes and bring it back in order to put it on display in Japan so that they could show to the Japanese public that they had shot down one of these planes, even though they hadn't, they hadn't shot them down, but they still needed to sort of maintain that, that public image for the public, you know, for the, the Japanese citizenry that they had, they'd been effective in sort of shooting them down and defending the homeland. So, so they were really outraged, but probably one of the biggest things that was going on at this point was that the Japanese were debating what they were going to do next in the war. You know, they had actually essentially accomplished all of their early wartime goals, the attack on Pearl Harbor, capture Singapore, Philippines, etc. And so they were trying to figure out what to do next. And Admiral Yamamoto, who had been the architect of the attack on Pearl Harbor, was really adamant that the attack on Pearl Harbor had actually been a failure, not a success, because America's aircraft carriers hadn't been there. And so he'd been saying, you know, we need to, we actually need to get into another fight with the United States so we can finish the job and sink those aircraft carriers before those aircraft carriers show up off the coast of Tokyo and bomb us. And so he had been pushing for a plan to take Midway, which was a is, is, is a small coral atoll about 1,200 miles from Hawaii. And it was the home at the time of an American submarine base and airfield. And he figured that it was so close to Hawaii and so important to America that if Japan made an effort to take that island, We'd have no choice but to bring our aircraft carriers into battle, and he'd have an opportunity to finish the job he failed to do at Pearl Harbor. But despite that, he was getting no support anywhere from either the Army or the Japanese Navy. And so this whole debate over whether to take Midway was playing out at the time Jimmy Doolittle and his raiders were coming in to attack Tokyo. Well, as soon as the Tokyo raid is over, you know everybody realizes Yamamoto was right. America's aircraft carriers, if they could still come in and attack Tokyo, then they were still a threat. It was important then to destroy them, and so the mission to take Midway was green-lighted. But Midway turned out to be a huge disaster for the Japanese. You know, the battle was fought in June of 1942, right after the Doolittle Raid, and the uh, Japanese lost four of their own aircraft carriers in that battle. Uh, the United States lost only one, and so it really helped level the playing field uh, from a naval perspective in the Pacific at that time. 
so and yeah, you know, and all that really happened in part because of the Doolittle raid. I mean, Jimmy Doolittle helped Yamamoto sell this plan to take Midway, which ended up being one of the greatest naval disasters for the Japanese. So, I mean, the Doolittle raid, you know, had a huge effects on the uh, on the outcome of the war. I mean, and that's what's amazing when you really think of this raid is, you know, the Doolittle raid had 80 airmen, 16 planes. Really, logistically, it's a very small operation compared to bombing attacks later in the war where we'd send 500 planes over Japan, you know, with 6,000 air. And we would, you know, do these huge bombing runs. But yet this one raid leads to the attack on Midway. And of course, beyond Midway, it led to huge retaliation against the Chinese uh, because, you know, the Doolittle's raiders had gone to China. They had landed there. Um, or bailed out there. They were aided by missionaries and Chinese guerrillas and fighters and, and, and local villagers. And the Japanese were furious. And so they set out to punish them. They uh, uh, literally wiped out whole towns and villages. Uh, an estimated quarter million men, women, and children were killed. And it, it evoked comparisons at that time to the, the rape of Nanking, which was the, uh, you know, when the Japanese had seized the Chinese capital in 1937, 38. So it's really just an incredibly awful time. They uh, they killed whole families. They cut off people's ears and noses. Uh, and, it's just, and they also unleashed bacteriological warfare in the form of anthrax, plague, and cholera. If you look at the uh, p- price paid by the Japanese in the disaster of Midway, the price paid by the Chinese and the deaths of so many civilians, I mean, it really, the Duma raid was really a very consequential raid even though it was such a small raid hmm. in retrospect compared to others. So it really, uh, yeah, had huge outcomes. As you say, defective and consequential, right. And I think exactly. I mean, after other raids that were done by the Americans, if you would give us a little bit of scope of it, because almost 330,000 people were killed and almost 8.5 million people were homeless after that, civilians. Certainly. Yeah, I mean, it really, you know, as I mentioned earlier, with the, the dual raiders were really small compared to the attacks later in the war. I mean, the United States... Later in the war, we'd send as many as 500 bombers a night over Tokyo, and uh, you know, and you'd have about 6,000 airmen in, in, in just one operation like this, flying and uh, uh, bringing in a, in a much bigger plane in the B-29. This was after we captured the Mariana Islands, which is Guam, Saipan, and Tinian, which really put the United States in bombing range of the Japanese homeland. And so, you know, these raids—I mean, one night in March 10th of 1945 literally burned down about 15 square miles of Tokyo. So these incredibly just uh, destructive raids uh, using incendiary bombs. So, uh, and that really gives you a, a counter too for just, you know, how how small the Doolittle raid was So uh, compared to these raids later in the war. And even if you compare the later raids in, the, uh, in Tokyo, how, if you, if you have a comparison with the Iraq uh, war bombing that was carried out, which was a much grander and much more uh, complex in scope. Yeah, I mean, you have to remember too. I mean, uh, weapon systems today are just so much more sophisticated. I mean, they're you know they're pinpointed using you know GPS. I mean, they really are just. I mean, they're just. It's back then. You know, we didn't have that level. I mean, these the, the, the gravity was what we used to sort of guide <laughs> bombs. So it really. You know, it, it really just, it, it's, a, it's almost an apples and oranges comparison and looking from then until today. Uh, and, you know, of course, one of the challenges, too, with the Japanese is that, you know, when you're bombing a city like Tokyo, uh, which didn't, they didn't really have zoning like we have in today's sense, where you have your residential areas in one place and you have your commercial districts elsewhere and your industrial separated, where you have sort of this separation of, of uses. You know, in Tokyo, you had everything just piled in together. You know, you had your uh, apartment complex next to, you know, a steel mill or a, you know, you had a you know, home shop next to, you know, uh, an elementary school. And on top of that, you had incredible density. I mean, Tokyo was one of the densest cities on earth at that time with about 100,000 people per square mile. So it really just, you know, it made, you know, it made bombing something that was going to be very destructive. And also it was going to take a huge toll on civilians as well as your, your military. Okay, yeah. Uh, what is the lesson that we can learn from this, if there is some, uh, to summarize the whole operation and the con- in the context of the broader war that was going on? Are there any lessons to be learned or people should remember something out of this? 
Yeah, you know, I mean, I, I'll tell you one of the things that just really stands out for me, you know, and looking back on this is that this is an example of just, um, of, you know, of ingenuity when push comes to shove. I mean, it really was a, an early example of cooperation between two armed services, which doesn't happen all that often. Uh, it was a challenge. You know, every step of the way of this process r- r- required incredible improvisation and, uh, and resourcefulness. And so, I mean, I think it's really an example of, you know, when you're the creative thinking that comes out of dire times. And uh, and also, you, on top of that, I would really point to, hey, you know, this is an incredibly dangerous operation. And you, these young men, many of them were barely more than teenagers that flew this raid. You know, they volunteered in the dark. They didn't know what they were doing. You know, they were told, hey, it's, we got a dangerous operation. Are you willing to go? And yet they all stood up and said yes. And so I think it's really, uh, you know, it speaks volumes for that generation of young men that they were willing to do this. So it really... Uh, yeah, it's just all around. I think it's truly one of the most incredible stories of World War II. Excellent. We have been talking to James Scott, the author of Target Tokyo, Jimmy Doolittle and the Raid that Avenged Pearl Harbor. Tell us a little bit more about you and how did you get involved in writing and what has been your professional career and uh, what kind of topics or subjects interest you? Yeah, so I, uh, you know, I've, I was originally a newspaper journalist, uh, is how I sort of got into this, covering everything from city council meetings and, you know, to, uh, uh, you know, to just local, local affairs. And then I ended up working as a, uh, as a military correspondent for the paper here in Charleston, South Carolina, sort of covering, we have a big Air Force, uh, community here. And so I was covering the Air Force. And so I did, you know, reporting assignments in Iraq and Afghanistan and, covered the tsunami that hit in Asia many years ago when the Air Force flew there. And so really, you know, what I do now kind of grew out of that. My first book was actually on my father's experience in the military. He'd been an officer on the uh, USS Liberty, which was a um, spy ship that we sent into the Middle East that the Israelis uh, attacked, killed 34 Americans, and injured 170 uh, others. And so, you know, while I was covering current military issues for my newspaper, I was talking to dad saying, yeah, tell me more about this experience you were involved in. Uh, and, and sort of those discussions and interviews really grew into my first book. And when I finished that up, I, uh, you know, I, knew I, I enjoyed writing about the military. I enjoyed the stories and meeting the veterans. And so, uh, you know, I was kind of looking for what I was going to do next. Well, I'd actually write when I graduated from college, I had lived in Japan. I'd been an English teacher over there in the, uh, at a public school. And so I knew a lot about Japan. I had been to Hiroshima, I spent time in Tokyo. I'd, I'd had in some of my neighbors where I lived had told me about what it was like during the uh, final days of the war. And so I had always had this interest in it. And so I just sort of, you know, started looking into stories related to World War II and specifically about the Pacific. I mean, that's the area I think that most interests me. That's where, you know, I've spent most of my time traveling and, and whatnot. So I did a book on the uh, submarine war, uh, looking at sort of the, uh, Several submarines that were success- helped America uh, win the submarine war. I did Target Tokyo, and I'm working on a book now on the uh, Battle of Manila, February 1945. I'm wrapping it up. It's the uh, bloodiest urban fight of the Pacific War, and it, uh, it led to some of the worst atrocities uh, of World War II, similar to what happened to the Chinese in the uh, after the Doolittle Raid. But you know, at the time, one of the things that I think a lot of people don't re- remember is that you know. The Philippines was an American colony. And so, you know, we had built Manila over four decades since we got it from Spanish from the Spanish American War into this sort of great American city in Asia, this sort of front door of these business markets. And it had been for Douglas MacArthur, it had been the closest thing he ever knew to a hometown. You know, his son had been born there, his mother had died there, he'd courted his wife there. And for him, you know, at the beginning of the war, after the attack on Pearl Harbor, you know, he ultimately has to flee the Philippines and leave behind uh, most of his troops. And so for him, he vowed to return. And this is really a book about that return and sort of the, the unexpected awfulness of the fight that ensued in, uh, in the Battle of Manila to retake the Philippine uh, capital. And it was a 29-day fight, and it, uh, it led to, you know, the total destruction of the city. It led to tens of thousands of civilians being killed in artillery fire and Japanese atrocities. And some of the, and these are some of the worst atrocities. I mean, literally they took, you know, hundreds of civilians, put them into buildings, locked the doors and set the buildings on fire. I mean, it's really just some unimaginable horror. And so I, as part of my research, I've 
spent um, some time in Manila interviewing survivors, doing archival work over there. One gentleman who survived it said, you know, I want to you know, sort of show you the path that my family took when we fled the Japanese. And so we did. And, you know, he took me and we ended up in the bottom of the Philippines General Hospital there, which still exists today, where, you know, we found the old elevator shaft where he and his family had gone to flee the Japanese and had spent five days uh, drinking water from a toilet bowl to survive. So, I mean, you just see these really incredible stories of what, you know, this, this urban fight was like. And it was a fight that we, we feared would be replicated if we had to drive the Japanese out, out of Singapore, out of Hong Kong, out of their own cities. But, uh, but ultimately, the war ended uh, before that. So it's, it's really just it's, it's, it's a story that so few people know, even people who really know World War II and really read about it and study it. It's just it's a story that hadn't been covered. And, it's, uh, and there's just so much there to tell. So, but I'm about done with it, and will hopefully be out in a little over a year. So, uh, and we'll have another opportunity to get together and have an interview. <laughs> oh, that'll be wonderful. When you when do you plan to publish the book? The book's due in just a few months. So I'm finishing it up now, and my guess is it'll probably come out in uh, in February of 2018. So not this next February, but the following February, because they'll probably try to tie it to the anniversary. The battle took place. Battle began February 3rd, 1945, and so you know you probably be you know, books you like to release them around the anniversary. Uh, so we'll probably want to be able to do it somewhere um, in the anniversary of that time. I think it'd be too fast to try to get out this next February. So it'll probably be the next. Do you write full time or do you also go on speaking tours or do you have any other profession as well? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I do this full time. In addition to, uh, I've got two children and a wife, so I've got a busy home life. But I, uh, I work full time doing this. I, uh, I, do, I do public speaking as well. Uh, particularly when I have a book that comes out, I'll frequently go around and, and promote it and talk about it. And even when I don't, even when I'm not on book tour, I'll you know, give talks and things like that. So, but otherwise, I spend most of my time researching and writing. You know, I spend a lot of time in archives, traveling all over, visiting archives, um, visiting with veterans, veterans families, trying to gather the material needed to sort of tell these stories. I and mean, Target Tokyo is a pretty big book. It's almost 700 pages. Right. The book I'm working on now in the Battle of Manila will be about the same. I mean, it just, you know, gathering all the information and then going through it all. I mean, compiling it. I and mean, just, just to give you an example, I mean, the Battle of Manila, I copied about 30,000 pages of war crimes depositions and trial transcripts and things like that, you know, and it takes months to read it all and to, you know, catalog it and take the notes from it and sort of organize it. So, I mean, there's so much of just reading and processing of information that goes into putting a book like this together. And the, the end hope is that when you read it, it's enjoyable, it reads smoothly like a novel. And But the, getting it to that point, you know, compiling the information, synthesizing it, telling that story, is just it takes so much work to do that. It's a lot of work. But I love it. There's meticulous yeah. research, and I'm sure you really enjoy it because it's not easy to do otherwise. No, it's a ton of fun. I mean, you really, I, I, I'm the luckiest guy in the world. I, uh, I love what I do. I wake up excited to, to learn this stuff. Well, thank you very much for your time and uh, exciting to uh, understand more about what really a greater detail than what it is in the book. Uh, and uh, please do keep us in mind when you have the next book ready. Awesome. I will definitely do so. Well, listen, thanks so much for having me on today. And I, uh, I hope I encourage folks, if you like what you heard, please check out the book, Target Tokyo, Jimmy Doolittle and the Raid that Avenged Pearl Harbor. Thank you. Thank you very much.